I was 18 when I joined up. This lady in Sydney in 1939, I was working in an office, and um, she decided that she'd form a group called the Women's Emergency Signalling Corps. The girls all about my age, about 17 and 18, we used to go there three nights a week. We used to climb up those stairs into a loft in a, a disused building in Sydney that she had, and she had all this equipment there. She not only taught us Morse code, but she taught us all forms of signalling that they use in the Navy, the Army and Air Force. She said, wherever you're travelling on a train or a tram, transform all the signs on the walls of the stations into Morse code as you go past them. And she said, you'll never forget Morse code. There weren't many electrical engineers that were women in those days. She had the foresight to, to realise that uh, they would need women in, in some capacity, and she thought probably as wireless operators. I was in the third lot of wireless operators that went in. I enlisted in Sydney and I was transferred to Malvern. We had an English sergeant major to teach us how to march and, and um, our general drill. We had to learn that, of course. Uh, he was not very happy at having to train women, I can assure you. We also had to wear men's overalls, we called them goonskins. We had to roll up the legs and roll up the arms and parade in those clothes. We're often mistaken for a postwoman or a tram conductress because no one had seen women in uniform before, of course. I was posted to Sydney. I was there when the Japanese came into the war. I was on duty the night that they announced that we were now at war with Japan and I took that message. It was in plain language and not in code, which was unusual. And uh, I was so frightened I could barely hold the pen to write the message. When I went to give it to the duty officer, I found that he'd gone into the town to have tea. <laughs> because, I mean, nothing much had really happened in our war until then, not really. I was transferred to Canberra. The wireless station there was designed to look like a shearing shed and we had three or four sheep grazing around in the back of the paddock uh, and the masts were disguised, you see, so that if a plane flew over, you, wouldn't, you would think it was just a farming shed. We had a couple of frights. I had the headphones on and it was terrible static because it was storm somewhere and the machine I was working on big, about this high it stood and uh, got struck by lightning and fortunately I had the headphones not on my ears or I'd been completely deaf. I just had them here sitting there on the side of my face because I wasn't taking a message at the time. I could hear the mast gas sort of go through my head but not through my ears and um, yeah, I was a bit sort of um, dumb for a while. I mean, I couldn't hear or think for a few minutes. But um, no, I was really lucky because they said if I'd have had the headphones on, you know, I'd have been completely deaf. I met Wes, he was a wireless operator too in the Air Force and he was transferred to Wagga and I met him there and um, we got engaged. I was transferred to Canberra and then not long afterwards, he was transferred to a squadron that was stationed in Canberra. You weren't allowed to be married and you weren't supposed to be engaged. So nobody really knew that we had any connection with each other. So I had a little while with him there before he went away to Dutch New Guinea. And um, I didn't see him for three years after that. It was a long time, a long time. Two of my friends there lost their fiancés missing, presumed dead, and of course they never came back. We were lucky. When he did come back, uh, I was on leave and uh, we got to see each other and I didn't even recognise him because he, he'd grown a, a big moustache and he, he was as black, uh, brown, you know, really, really brown, really dark brown, nearly black. I hardly knew him. And <laughs> 
I said, I can't have that moustache. He said, no, I can't have it much longer either. It's very prickly. So that came off. We got married in uh, September in 1945 and I was discharged from the Air Force in October. So I was still in the Air Force when we got married so I had to borrow a wedding dress because, you know, I never had any coupons to buy me. So a friend lent me a wedding dress and, I, and the nuns from a convent, the lady next door to me was a, a devout Catholic. She borrowed a veil for me that was, I don't know, hundreds years old or something and had all this embroidery on it. All I can remember about the wedding was terrified that somebody could stand on this tremendous veil. <laughs> That's all I can remember about my wedding. You'll never forget Morse code. Though I've forgotten the shorthand, I can remember Morse code. <laughs> never forget it. Sometimes we pick a bit of it up here and there, but it's gone out now, they're not using it anymore. Never thought that had happened, but it has. Still in my head. <laughs> Still in my head. <laughs>